awesome. Uh, so cool to be surrounded by, by family and church family as we uh, try to, you know, do our best to, to raise our kids. It's not an easy thing, and so we need each other and get to support each other. And so thank you for being a community of faith, a church family. It's good to be together this morning. Good to, uh, good to just be able to be here to worship, celebrate, celebrate these moments uh, in our lives, parent-child dedication, and, and now just uh, for, for a bit to be able to look at, uh, at Scripture. And so if you have your Bibles, to turn with me to Matthew chapter 6 to be taught by Jesus about how to pray. Matthew chapter 6. And um, yeah, just we've, we've been in this series for three weeks now called Teach Us to Pray, uh, learning what it means to deepen our life of prayer. That we, we talked last week that our goal isn't to develop a prayer life. Like sometimes uh, Christians will talk about, well, I have a prayer life. And then we could ask the question, well, what about the rest like, of life? If this is my prayer life, what, what about the rest? And so the goal isn't so much to develop a prayer life, but a life of prayer. And, and so no matter where you are on the journey with Jesus, no matter uh, whether prayer is like a foreign language to you and you've, you've never prayed and you don't really know what that means to pray, or whether you pray daily or um, for, for decades, you, you just cultivated this connection with your Creator, I think God is inviting us to take a step, a step of growth on the journey of saying, what does it look like for us to deepen our life of prayer? And the best way to deepen our life of prayer is not uh, to preach sermons on prayer. Uh, let's be really honest about that. I mean, the best way to deepen our life of prayer is not to listen to sermons or teachings on prayer. What's the best way to deepen our life of prayer? It's to pray. Uh, is to pray, is just to take a step and to, to make prayer more and more a rhythm of our life. And so I really want to encourage you for the next couple of, couple of days, for these next few weeks, especially as we move toward Easter, the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus in, in two weeks, uh, to, to be intentional about deepening this life of prayer, that God loves you and he wants to be in communication with you. And it is an incredible gift, an incredible privilege that we get of just being able to talk, to talk to God. And so one of the things that Jesus is doing for us in this Lord's Prayer is he's teaching us how to see the world differently, like to see the world through the lens of prayer and the way God sees it. How many of you like Tetris? Any like Tetris fans in here, right? Have you guys played Tetris? Like just, I'm, I'm really curious. I don't know if Tetris is still popular or not. Show of hands, who's played Tetris? Okay, who's played Tetris within the last week? Okay, like a couple people, a few people. All right, so maybe you'll resonate with this. There's something called the Tetris effect. The Tetris effect, you can Google this later today and um, listen to talks on this or um, read articles about it, but the Tetris effect is this. So if, just for those of you who don't know what Tetris is, like it's this game where like these blocks fall from the sky and they're different shapes, and you have to fit them in uh, to, the, to the slots along the way so that you get a full line across the bottom, and when you get a full line, it is the most joyful experience of the day. It clears the line, right? Whew, it's just gone. And you got to do this really fast. It speeds up so that the, the stack doesn't build to the top or you lose the game. But here's what research shows, is that if you play Tetris for 15 minutes, you, your brain changes. You succumb to what's called the Tetris effect, and that means when you stop playing the game, and especially if you play it right before bed and you close your eyes, what do you see? You see Tetris blocks like falling from the sky and you're like trying to arrange them. Or like if you go into your kitchen, like they say the Tetris effect will take over and you'll start to like arrange things and you start to like see Tetris in your normal life. Have you ever experienced this? Um, so you, again, you look it up later today. It's, it's pretty fascinating. The Tetris changes our brain. And I think the same thing is true of prayer. I think the same thing is true of the Lord's Prayer. Like when we pray these words, when we're formed in prayer um, by these, these holy words that Jesus has given us, it changes the way we see our relationships with each other. It changes the way we interact with our coworkers and our friends. It changes the way we, we, we perceive ourselves as child, uh, children of God. And so prayer is, is incredibly powerful in our lives. And so we want to we take these words to heart, we want to listen to Jesus, and so today we're looking at just this one verse, verse 12, Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, and here's what Jesus says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Would you say this with me? And forgive us our debts 
as we also have forgiven our debtors. So Jesus has taught us so far in the Lord's Prayer how to come into God's presence, to relate to God as Father who loves us, but who is also holy and above us, beyond us. Uh, he's taught us how to put our will underneath God's will, to pray for God's kingdom, God's will to be done, God's name to be made holy. And he, then he's taught us, like last week, how to bring our needs to God, like that God really cares about our needs. Give us today our daily bread. We, we need things in our life and we need to consume just to survive. We bring all our needs to God because he cares. And he says to pray for forgiveness. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now here's the thing that struck me this week about this that I've never noticed before. Of all the times you have prayed the Lord's Prayer, read this, I've never noticed that the verse begins with and. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Which means um, it's linked to what has come right before it. Which what came right before it is give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That I've never sort of linked those two things together to say I need daily bread just to survive and I need daily forgiveness just to continue walking in God's mercy. That forgiveness is this moment by moment, day by day need that we have just like the physical things of life like bread and food for our bodies. We need forgiveness like we need a shower. Now, how many of you would say, you know what? It would be logical to say, showers don't work. I'm going to stop taking showers. Like, I'm making a vow today. You know what? It, it doesn't work because I took a shower, like, I took a shower last Monday, and by, like, Monday night, I needed another one. And so it obviously didn't work. And so I'm just, like, I'm done. I'm done. I'm thrown in the bag. No more showers for me. How many of you say, well, that's a wise choice, right? Yes. Okay, we got a couple of, couple of high school guys who are like, I did that a long time ago. That's no problem. That's why you're sitting by yourself. <laughs> Your circle of friends gets a lot smaller. It was like, well, showers obviously don't work. So, you know, because you just, you need, you're going to need one. Yesterday, I ran a 0.1K and I came home and I was like, I mean, all the training and hydration and carb loading and I came home all sweaty. I needed another shower. Um, but this is like, just like you need a daily shower to sort of cleanse your body. Jesus is teaching us that we need to just remember that we're walking in mercy and to receive forgiveness because there's a pretty good chance that I'm going to get dirty and I'm going to stink by the end of the day and I'm going to need a shower, right? It's just the way it is. And so will you. And there's a pretty good chance that we're going to mess things up in our life throughout the day, that we're going to somehow sin, that we're going to miss the mark with God. Uh, we are not going to love God with our whole heart. We're going, uh, not going to love our neighbor as ourselves. That there are these sins of commission, things we do that we wish we wouldn't do, you know? Like, I mean, you get to the end of the day and you realize, I, I shouldn't have done that. Those are sins of commission. We did something we shouldn't have. But they're also sins of omission. We didn't do something we should have. This is what James 4, 17 says. For the one who knows the good they ought to do but does not do it for them, it is sin. And so, like, we go throughout our day and we realize, I was prompted by God to do this thing, and I, and I didn't do it, and so I, I missed it. I, there was, was sin, and so I, I need to just step into God's mercy just like I need a shower to remind myself, God, you are, you are good, and you are forgiving, and you are loving, and I need your cleansing so that I can step into today as a new day. So what would happen if even for the next two weeks as we head toward Easter, it was like when you take a shower, which you hopefully do every day, it was a prayer practice for you to say, God, I... I need forgiveness from you today. I need to not only receive forgiveness and cleansing for my soul, but I need to give forgiveness. I need, I need to give mercy away to people. How about that? Um, Jesus, you, what you'll notice when he talks about forgiveness is there's always, it's always like two directions. We receive mercy and forgiveness from God and we give mercy and forgiveness to others. Like you notice this, forgive us uh, our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. You know, it's like past tense. We've already forgiven our debtor. Like, we've already forgiven those who've sinned against us, who've hurt us. So God, forgive it. And, and that can be a hard thing for Christians to sort of, to absorb. Like, if I told you, like right now, like I believe that during this service, like during the next 20 minutes, that God is going to ask you to forgive that person. Like, that God is going to want you to to walk out of this space, this worship gathering, having, having forgiven that person. 
How do you feel? Is there, is there some defensiveness that starts to, but I don't want to? Are there some walls that begin to go up? And that's a, that's a really good thing to take notice of. Like if, if when in the context of a conversation in learning how to pray from Jesus about prayer, if we say, I, I don't want to, it's something for us to just notice inside of ourselves and to say, God, what do you want me to do with this? Because here's the thing, forgiveness is freedom. Forgiveness is freedom. It is incredible freedom. That when we realize that we have blown it, that we have, we have messed up, that we have um, just so, sort of stepped out of line and we have hurt ourselves or we have hurt others, to receive forgiveness is one of the most amazing gifts we can be given. And Jesus just talks about God as just being so rich in mercy, that God loves to give forgiveness. He loves to give forgiveness. Um, one day, Jesus is, he's, he's been talking about forgiveness, and the disciples pick up on it, and, and they start to, like, ask questions about it, and, and maybe just like us now, if like, well, but what about this? But what about, that per- what about that person? What about this scenario? Eric, you have no idea what this person did. And we start to ask questions like that. But this person has hurt me, like, again and again and again, and all of that. And so Jesus... Um, he has these disciples who are just like us. I mean, they, they ask those questions. And so Peter's like the ever practical one, right? Peter, one of the disciples, the ever practical one. Peter, he kind of goes to Jesus one day and says, okay, Jesus, you've been talking about forgiveness, but like, here's the question. It's a good question, Jesus. This is my paraphrase, right? It's a good question. How many times should I forgive? How many times? Like seven? And you can imagine Peter being like, pat on the back, like, I'm sure it's only like two or three that you're requiring us, but I'm just going to go out of limb and almost say seven because I'm that holy and righteous. And you can see Peter like almost like pulling. I picture this as like he pulls out his scroll with his little number two pencil like you're taking a test. Remember when you numbered on the, the left side of your paper, you're taking the test? And so it's like, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And Andrew is like, Andrew, you're on number six here, buddy. You got one more, seven, we're done. And so Jesus, um, this, is, this is where Peter's at. Like, so Jesus, how many times should I forgive? Should I forgive seven times? And Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, not seven. How about 70 times seven? 70 times seven, carry the four. 490! I don't have room on my scroll for 490 slots. And Jesus would say, exactly, why don't you just put the scroll away? I was talking to our kids about this. Uh, You know what the scroll represents, right? It it represents that ledger that we hold with other people. Because when somebody hurts us, it's like they've taken out a debt against us. It's like they've somehow, they've hurt our worth, they've hurt our value. And, and when somebody does something or says something to us, it's like, it's like they owe us something. And that's why Jesus uses the word debts very intentionally. It, it, when these offenses, they hurt us. And when we see that person, we remind it exactly of what they owe us, exactly of what they cost us. And, and so... Um, So that's what that scroll represents. And Jesus would just be saying to Peter, Peter, like, would you just, would you be willing to put the scroll away? And so I was telling this story to my kids, my kids last night, and I'm like, what's 70 times seven? So they do the math. I'm like, 490. And Brenna, she's like, but dad, I would forget. I would lose track. And I said, I think that's kind of the point. I think that's the point. Is that Jesus is teaching us how to step into this, this shower of mercy where we receive it and then we're willing to just give it. Now, forgiveness is not condoning what that person did. Let me make that very, very clear. Forgiveness is not saying, it's okay, we're good, no worries, just, yeah, forget about it. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is not saying there shouldn't be consequences. Because there are actions that, that bring consequences, and, and there are real consequences for our actions. And so forgiveness is not saying, no, 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 there shouldn't be consequences. Does that make sense? Forgiveness is not reconciliation. Like, there are moments when we forgive someone who we should not reconcile with. Reconciliation is forgiveness plus trust. That's reconciliation. If, if you can forgive someone, I mean, Jesus calls us to forgive, but the question, the next question is, do I trust this person? Do I trust this person? 
And if I trust them, then we move toward reconciliation. But Jesus is not inviting us to just like, forgiveness does not mean I'm just going to make myself a doormat to get hurt again and again and again. Can we be clear on that? Like, does that make sense? You know the old phrase, like, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me three times. I'm going to take my hat off because you're really good at this. Um, fooling people. That was a something. Never mind. No. Um, so, so Jesus, he's teaching us to, to forgive. Forgiveness is freedom. Forgiveness is choosing to cancel the debt that that person owes us. And that's what he's inviting us to do. Forgiveness is freedom. And, and Jesus, after this interaction with Peter, he tells a story. And, and when Jesus starts to tell a story, you know you're going to get schooled. Like, right? I mean, if we're disciples, Jesus starts telling a story. It's like, oh, man, like my world is about to spin. And so here's what Jesus, the story he tells. He says, so there was this guy who had this massive debt, massive debt, a debt he couldn't ever pay. Uh, Kevin, our, one of our pastors at uh, McPherson, Kevin Wilder, he like crunched the numbers on this. If you take the numbers in the story in, in Matthew 18, and you take them to today's averages, this man owed a debt of, of $10 billion, just to put it in today's like numbers. So $10 billion is what he owes. And he, his, the man he owes the debt to uh, calls the note and says it's, it's time to pay up. And he comes before him and he realizes, I can't pay this. So he falls on his knee and, knees and he begs for mercy. And what does the, the man do? The, the one who held the debt says he had compassion on him and he canceled the debt. Twenty billion dollars. He cancels the debt. And it's this amazing picture of mercy, this man begging on his knees saying, I could never pay this debt. I could never pay it. And the man who held the note said, you're forgiven. The debt is canceled. So this man gets up off of his knees and he, he's feeling the freedom of, of this mercy that he had experienced. And then he goes and he realizes that there's this other man who owes him money. And it's a significant debt. In today's terms, it would be somewhere around $20,000. That's significant, right? Somebody owes you 20 grand. That's a big deal. Is it a big deal in comparison to, 20, to, to 50 billion? Or what did I say it was? 20 billion, 50 billion? Over a billion dollars, it doesn't really matter. Right? And so Jesus paints this picture of this, this man who's been forgiven this massive debt, but then he goes and he, he begins to choke and assault and attack this man who owes him money. He says, I'm going to throw you in jail until you pay the very last penny. And Jesus is painting this picture of saying, you want to know what God's economy of mercy is like? It's like having a $20 billion debt canceled. And so what Jesus is asking us to do, this is what God does. This is who God is. God is so merciful and so gracious and so forgiving, and we get to be the beneficiaries of that. We get to receive that. And then Jesus just says, would you then be willing to cancel the debts that others have against you? Would you be willing to, to, to take that scroll and to put it away, to take the record and put it away and to cancel, to cancel that debt? And this is freedom. We realize that it's not just freedom for the one we're forgiving, but it's freedom for us. It's freedom for us. It, it, when you're carrying around that, that like, you know, that sense of you owe me something, it will eat us. I mean, it will just eat us from the inside out. It will, the, the, the bitterness, the anger, the resentment, it will rob us of life. And so forgiveness, Jesus is calling us to freedom. Now some of, some of you, I'll be real honest, you don't believe me. And I would say it's not that you said you don't believe me, it's like the question you have to ask is, do you believe Jesus? Do you believe Jesus? Because some things with Jesus, in fact, lots of things with Jesus, we won't know what it's like until we actually do it. If you're sitting here, it's like saying, I, I, until I know exactly what it's going to be like on the other side of forgiveness, until I know that this person is going to like, be changed or whatever, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to release it. But see, with Jesus, he calls us to obedience before understanding. And so sometimes it's just, you know, Jesus, you said it. I trust you. And so I'm going to choose to forgive. I'm going to choose to lay down this offense that this other person owes me. And I'm going to believe that on the other side of obedience, on the other side of forgiveness, I'm going to experience the freedom that I can't on this side. Does that make sense? So would you take the step of obedience and just forgive, forgive. Uh, forgiveness is freedom. Forgiveness is also power. Forgiveness is not weakness. Forgiveness is power. It is all power. Now this is, the world gets us so upside down, so upside down. We think vengeance is power. We think like, 
you know, justice that says, you did this, now you pay this. That's power, power to make people pay. But Jesus gives us this whole different picture of power. Like the, in John's gospel, right, John 13, Jesus is having a meal with his disciples, and there's this, this fascinating um, just line from John who says, and Jesus, knowing that the Father has put all power under him, under his authority. So Jesus, like in this meal, he knows that he has all power. All power in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus, right? Is that, you with me? And what does Jesus do with all power? The first thing he does is he serves his disciples who are in just a few hours going to betray him, who are going to hurt him, who are going to abandon him. So what does all power look like? Well, the first thing it looks like is a servant. It, it, it serves even those who are going to hurt him. And then Jesus willingly goes to the cross. He, he says, like, they're not taking my life from me. I'm willingly laying down my life. And so Jesus goes to the cross, and he takes, like, all the violence. He takes all the ugliness. He takes all of the, the shame that the cross was supposed to give him, and he takes it all into himself. And what does all power do? All power processes all of that ugliness and sin, and he recycles it into forgiveness. And Jesus on the cross says, Father, forgive them because they don't even know what they're doing. If, you're, if your vision of almighty God expressing power looks different than Jesus on the cross praying for the forgiveness of his enemies, then your vision of almighty God needs to be changed. The, the, the Christ on the cross is the clearest picture of what God's power looks like. To choose to forgive someone is an act of immense power. This is what the kingdom of God is all about. It is not weakness. It is not, um, it is not choosing. It is not choosing to, to sort of be a victim. Weakness is not living in the power that is over us from another person, but forgiveness is choosing to take the power that we have and to cancel the debt and to take this weight that has, has been placed on us to, to, to release it. Forgiveness is... is um, Freedom, forgiveness is power, and freedom is be- uh, forgiveness is beautiful. Forgiveness is beautiful. I mean, there's something so ugly about the cross, right? I mean, there's just something, it's so ugly, it's so be- uh, like just grotesque and, and hideous. Like what was done, it's, it's, the, it's the world's worst crime, the cross is. It, it is it's like deicide, Right? It's, it's the killing of God. It, it is Jesus in flesh, who is God, the presence of God, innocent and holy and pure, being killed by sinful humanity. I mean, it's the world's worst crime. And so it is, it is absolute ugliness what happens on the cross. And yet, what does the cross represent for us? Mercy and love and a new beginning and fresh starts and hope. Like, all of these things, and it is that way because the cross is the symbol of forgiveness. It's a symbol of forgiveness. And so the world, like, forgiveness is the hope of the world. Jesus, like forgiveness, is the hope of the world. There's something so beautiful about it that it changes us, it changes hearts in ways nothing else can. And so I want to I end just by sharing a story. I, I just want to honor the, these faithful brothers by sharing a bit of their story it was a story from uh, the, these tr- French Trappist monks who moved to Algeria and developed this monastery in the hills of uh, Algeria and w- were called by God there to develop relationships with a predominantly Muslim community. And over the course of a couple of decades, this monastery became a place of incredible peace, uh, fostered like People would come, even Muslims, Christians together would come together and pray, would come and talk about faith, and would talk about Jesus, and the love and life of Jesus was felt in this place. They took care of people's physical needs. They had a doctor who was one of the monks who they would bring their sick to, and and he would care for them and love them like every person was Jesus himself. This is an incredible, incredible witness to the good news of Jesus. Well, a civil war broke out in Algeria in the early 90s. And this, like, this, this, radical, um, this radical wing of Islam s- starts to gain, um, to gain some momentum, and they realize there have been some other attacks on foreigners in Algeria, and they realize that for them to choose to stay is probably for them to choose to die. 
And so there's, this, there's a movie made about this called Of Gods and Men, and uh, Carmen got it for me for my birthday. How about this is that for a birthday gift, right? I asked for it, by the way. I was like, could you get me this really, like, hard movie to watch? Yeah. Uh, it's, in, it's in French and has English subtitles, but it is, it is it's beautiful. And these men go through this deliberation of what do we do? Do we go or do we stay? And they all seven decide to stay, knowing very full well what it's going to mean. And so it turned out to be about a year before they were eventually attacked and killed. About a year before this, uh, the leader of this monastery, his name was Christian de Serge. He wrote what became his last testament. It was a letter that he wrote to his family and his friends that was only to be opened upon his death. And here's, here's what he says, a year before his death. I just want to read a part of it to honor, to honor them. If it should happen one day, and it could be today, that I become a victim of terrorism, which now seems ready to encompass all of the foreigners living in Algeria, I would like my community, my church, my family to remember that my life was given to God and to this country. I ask them to accept that the one master of all life was not a stranger to this brutal departure. I ask them to pray for me, for how could I be found worthy of such an offering? I ask them to be able to associate such a death with the many other deaths that were just as violent but forgotten through indifference and anonymity. My life has no more value than any other, nor any less. In any case, it is not the innocence of childhood. I have lived long enough to know that I share in the evil which seems, alas, to prevail in the world, even in that which would strike me blindly. I should like, when the time comes, to have clear space, which would allow me to beg forgiveness of God and to and all of my fellow human beings, and at that same time to forgive with all my heart the one who would strike me down. Obviously, my death will justify the opinion of some of those who dismissed me as naive or idealistic. Let let us hear what he has to say now. But such people should know that my death will satisfy my most burning curiosity. At last, I will be able, if God pleases, to see the children of Islam as he sees them, illuminated through the glory of Christ, sharing in God's gift of his passion and of the Spirit, whose secret joy will always be to bring forth our common humanity amongst our differences. I give thanks to God for this life, completely mine, yet completely theirs too, to God who wanted for joy against and in spite of all odds. In this thank you, which says everything about my life, I include you, my friends, past, present, and those friends who will be here at the side of my mother and father and of my sisters and brothers, thank you a thousandfold. And hear these closing words. And to you, my friend of the last moment, who will not know what you are doing, yes, for you too, I wish this thank you. This adieu, whose image is in you also, that we may meet in heaven like happy thieves, if it pleases God, our common Father. Amen. Like there is something so profoundly beautiful about forgiveness, about the forgiveness that we see in Jesus and the forgiveness that we see expressed through Jesus' followers throughout history. The world does not need more arguments. It needs more beauty. It needs more love expressed in forgiveness. So God, we come and we bring our whole selves to you today. And Jesus, we fully admit that we have sinned in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions. That we have not loved you with our whole heart and we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have sinned by what we have done and by what we have left undone. And so, God, we are truly sorry and we humbly repent. And for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we can walk in freedom and joy of having our burdens laid at your feet. God, thank you for your mercy that you give us, that you cleanse us and invite us to walk in freedom and power and beauty. And God has forgiven people. 
as those who've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, by his life, by his death, and by his resurrection. Jesus, we bring just to you here and now those people who owe us something, our debtors. God, those who have hurt us by the things that they said, by the things that they did. And Jesus, we bring them into your presence and we ask that you would teach us what it means to forgive them. Jesus, would you teach us what it means to lay down the debt and to release them to you. God, I pray that you would give us the power through your Holy Spirit to forgive, to speak the words, even here, even now, I forgive you. I forgive you. Jesus, thank you for the example on the cross of taking all of the pain and processing it into forgiveness, even forgiveness that nobody asked for, that the Roman soldiers didn't ask for it, Caiaphas didn't ask for it, Pilate didn't ask for it, and yet you forgave it. And thank you for all of those faithful brothers and sisters who have led the example of how to do this. God, teach us. Teach us to forgive and to walk in the power of that today. In Jesus' name.